Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Royal Chess. My name is Jan Marcos and this is my ninth part of my series uh, dedicated to Anatoly Karpo and his strategical gems. Um, this series will consist of 10 parts, so this we are coming to, to an end. And today we will focus on a seemingly abstract topic, which is coordination of uh, your pieces. And also maybe the topic um, like of how to how to create a plan in some strategical position, because this is quite uh, typical for club players, which are not professionals, that they uh, might have problems to find a suitable plan in such po in, in in a position where seemingly not much happens. There there is like no um, no tactics, uh, no. Um, no clear plans and many players uh, struggle in those positions and they just simply write, uh, simply play something just because they they don't want uh, they, they don't know what to do so they just put a uh, big random move and play it um, but Anatoly Karpo was one of the best uh, players when it came to maneuvering and and coordinating all the pieces together so that uh, the Black's army or the, the Karpos army, Black's army in this case, um, creates some kind of a symphony or a, a, a good team. So we will uh, focus on a game between Fraguel Agil and obviously Anatoly Karpo, which was played in Montia in 1976. Uh, there was a huge difference in, um, in the strength of both opponents, at least officially, because Fraguel Agil was rated just 2 3 80, and Anatoly Karpo was rated like 300 points more. Of course, uh, in 1976, uh, having uh, the almost two, 2,400 ELO points uh, meant something. Maybe today Fraguel Agil uh, would, be, uh, would be rated like 100 points more, but still he wasn't like one of the extra super grandmasters of those days. So. Uh, this will be felt a bit also on the game. Uh, the game is rather one-sided, but there still are quite interesting, instructive moments which, uh, which uh, some, somehow attracted my attention, and I hope that you will like them as well. So let's have a look. So white went g3 and black c5, bishop g2, g6, Fragula g is white and Karpo is black, c4. Bishop g7, knight c3, knight c6. This already is quite an interesting moment because as you can see, uh, Anatoly Karpo wasn't uh, wasn't trying to find some quick um, disbalance in the game. He is uh, willing to play a symmetrical position uh, being a tempo down against a much, much uh, lower, rated, uh, lower rated opponent. Um, there was a big dispute between uh, Aaron Nimtsevich and Richard Reti, no, uh, sorry, uh, and Tarash uh, in the 30s about uh, whether symmetrical positions are leading to the equality or rather to a small advantage for the for, for white for the side with the extra tempo. Um, now today we can say that uh, these disputes were rather senseless and too abstract to 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 have some clear solution. But still, it's quite clear that you cannot automatically be better uh, with black when you are playing symmetrical positions. But still, Karpo was self-confident enough to, to play like this and uh, to, to wait for creating the disbalance a bit later. Now white went e3, and the first sign of disbalance is this knight h6. This is quite interesting. The knight goes to f5, from where it will um, um, put some pressure on the d4 square and also uh, not hinder the g7 bishop in its view. So the knight uh, might uh, be better placed on f5 than on f6, uh, but still, well, of course, this maneuver costs time, so we will see what happens. Now white went knight e2, black went knight f5, so for the time being d4 is not an option, black would simply take it, so white turned his attention to the b2 b4 break, so he went a3, castles, rook b1, and again the same strategy, Karpo hinders the, the break and goes a5. Castles, black one d6, d3. 
So uh, as you can see, uh, uh, um, a very calm positional uh, English game from the English opening uh, arose. Um, we may play some more moves, black one rook b8. Uh, it's always useful to, 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 to get the rook away from the x-ray of the white g2 bishop, although of course uh, b7, b5 um, will be very difficult uh, to, to play. Uh, black is not intending to play b7, b5, rather he would maybe like to play b7, b6 and bishop b7 or something such. And now white one bishop d2. Uh, this is rather interesting uh, because the bishop is not very well placed on d2. Uh, on d2 uh, it might seem that it helps to play the b2 b4 break but um, black still controls the, the b4 square quite a few times um, and uh, on the contrary on d2 the bishop uh, is hindering his own queen so it's very difficult for white to play d3, d4, and also the bishop is not very actively placed there. So now black played e6 and white knight f4. And the, interestingly enough, this almost a symmetrical position. The only asymmetries in the position are uh, the, 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 is the placement of the a-pawns and also the fact that white already played the game, the, the, the move um, bishop c1, d2. And this is a, a position which I really love to give to my pupils and I'm asking them like what would you play here and how would you how would you continue and many of them struggle even quite a strong players like international masters and grandmasters might have problems with this position because well what what should black do um, the answer in my opinion is quite logical it's not the only answer, if you would just put this position uh, to Stockfish, I'll give it to Stockfish, uh, the silicon brain would tell you that, um, for example, knight d5 is a suitable more bishop d7 or something, queen d7 even, but you need a plan, you, you, you don't want just to play knight d5, then white would answer something like queen e2, and you still don't know what to do. So Karpo was uh, looking for a viable plan, and I think that we could uh, like reconstruct his train of thought like this. Uh, Black Day definitely doesn't want to play e6, e5, because then white would sit on d5 and, and, and the, the strong d5 square would give him some advantage. Also, it's very difficult for black to play b7, b5, because white is too many times there. He's controlling the b5 square well. So the only break which black can play is d d6, d5. But in order to play this this uh, this move, uh, black needs to put um, to, to control the d5 square like two more times. So one of one of the pieces which could control the d5 square is the c8 bishop. But for that we need we need to put it to b7. So we need to play b7, b6. But then this this knight would be would, would, would be taken. So we need to cover the knight first. So our um, aim is to play d5. In order to do that we need to cover the c6 square and the d5 square as well. And therefore Karpo played knight fe7. This is quite a, quite a strange move um, as because it was in a symmetrical position knight f5 e7 was the answer to knight e to f4 which looks uh, rather bizarre, but it makes a lot of sense because with knight e to f4, white said, I'm not going to play d4, so the guardian of, of the d4 square, knight, the f5 knight, is uh, more or less useless there. And also white play bishop c1 d2, which uh, furthermore makes the d4 move more difficult. And now black has got a pl clear plan, and this is what we all uh, need and want in chess to get a queer, clear plan, then we are playing very well. So why the black wants to play something like b6, bishop, b7, queen, d7, ogre of the end, and d5. And this is exactly, basically exactly what happened in the game. So white went queen c2, black played b6 as planned, rook bd1. As you can see, this is the second move with the rook, which is uh, quite uh, notable that white was uh, willing to, to spend the tempo like this. Bishop b7, 
And um, already why well, Black is, is thinking about playing d5 sooner or later. Now white played knight b5, trying to make use of the weak b5 square. And perhaps black could have played d5 already, but Karpo was a very patient pawn and is still a very patient player, so he played queen d7. And he just want to put the rook to, to d8 and then play d5. There is a rule which says that if you are able to, to uh, improve your pieces in the given structure, you shouldn't change the 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 the, the structure of, of the, the pawn structure of the position if you still have means how to improve your pieces in the given structure. So black is improving his pieces in the given structure, queen d7 or d, and then he is going to change it. Now bishop c3 was played and black played knight d5. Um, this is quite interesting. Uh, for black, it is better to exchange the light squared bishops, so because then the white king is a bit, bit weaker. Uh, if the, uh, the the dark squared bishops were uh, exchanged instead, then it would be very difficult for black to, to oh, not very difficult, but more difficult for black to keep his king safe. So now white played e4. This is a rather interesting moment because now white um, thinks that the, the d4 square is uh, very well um, covered with the pieces, so he doesn't need to. To, um, to cover it with the pawn anymore, and in a way he's, he's correct, because for example after knight 5 c6 white would go, simply go d4. So there is no way how to make use of the d4 square for, for um, Karpo now, but at this moment Karpo went simply d5. And this is the crucial moment of the game, because uh, objectively the position is still close to equal, but white um, would need to play a very, very um, counterintuitive uh, way. In a very counterintuitive way, he would need to take e takes d5, e takes d5, and then play d4, knight c4, and a4. So this is the computer line, which gives white a lot of compensation for the pawn because of the weakness of the d5 pawn and also uh, the, the nice coordination of white species. But could you imagine to 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 uh, simply sacrifice a pawn against Carpo like this, um, with white pieces in like move 17? If it, uh, in case that it would uh, not give you sufficient compensation, you would simply feel like a fool. Uh, it's all, also quite difficult to see that that white can give make such a call move as a3, a4, and still keep a lot of a lot of play. So this is something what was possible, and um, probably that was the only and last way to equality for white. But instead of that, um, Fraguela Jill played uh, rook f e1, and of course black played d4, bishop d2. And now you can see that black's position simply has improved a lot, because uh, he has got uh, plenty of space in the uh, in the center. And also, please note that that this that this b5. Um, knight is somehow out of play with the pawn on d4. The situation is rather different than with the pawn on d6. Now uh, the, 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 this knight has got no objects to attack, and also knight c3 is impossible because of the d4 d4 pawn. So now, interestingly, um, uh, Karpo again uh, played uh, to, to pro a prophylactic maneuver. He played bishop c6. Now, of course, um, the, the knight is hanging, so white covered himself with a4, and, uh, and Karpo went back with bishop b7, um, opening the way for his knights to c6. But with uh, this seeming loss of a tempo, white spoiled, uh, black spoiled white structure on the queen side, and there is no b2b4 uh, anymore. So sometimes you don't need to improve your own pieces and uh, on your own position. Uh, it's enough to, to make your opponent's positions uh, worse because the difference in your um, positions and in your setups is what matters. Now white went bishop c1, rook b8, and of course now black concentrates on the king side because of this knight, which is out of play. Knight h3, uh, white want, wants to answer f5 with f4 and e5. So black has to fight against that, f4, e5, so now Karpo was able to 
um, to make sure that the center opens. Rook f1, f5. So as you can see, the the the, the white rook, uh, white d1 rook made two moves. Rook b1, rook d1 to get to d1, and this f1 rook also made two moves, rook e1 and rook f1 to get to f1. So it, it, it can be seen that white, white uh, wasn't maneuvering very successfully with his rook in this game. f takes e5, knight takes e5, e takes f5, knight, f, knight takes f5. Now please know the difference between, between the black knights and the white knights. The black knights are simply dominating this, the, the, the central uh, situation, the uh, central uh, space on, on the board, whereas the white knights are simply scattered around the, around the chessboard. White tried to improve his knight's position with knight f4, black played bishop h6, knight d5, now black was happy to exchange um, his uh, so-called bad bishop, and also he, he exchanged on d5 and play king g7. And again, it might seem that uh, white's pieces are very well placed, but they are doing uh, nothing, no, nothing special at least, whereas the black knight on f5 is, um, is threatening to get to e3 with a decisive effect. Um, and please note how harmonious black's play was. He, was, he played d5, d4. Uh, d6, d5, d4, so he got a strong hold on d4, and therefore he got a, an outpost on e3, and then he worked hard on the king's side to, 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 to make, uh, to create a way, a path for his knight to this outpost, and now he's got there. Bishop e4, knight e3, tuk tuk, rook e1, and now black played queen h3, and that was the last uh, move in the game, because uh, black uh, uh, changed his focus from the player in the center, he changed his focus to the king side, and as you can see, he has got multiple threats there. Uh, for example, he, he can play something, let's say, after b3. This is, all, of course, a non-sequential move, but I just wanted to, to, to make some move to, to get further, or to show black's uh, intentions. For example, nice move is rook f2. After king takes f2, queen takes h2, bishop g2, queen takes g2, this is a mate. Uh, if white would love to to cover the uh, the f2 square with the queen, for example, uh, queen d2, then another another mate comes. For example, queen f1, rook takes and rook takes f1. You can simply see that in the in the final position the the the, the, uh, the outnumbering of um, of of white's army is very visible. Black is attacking with all his pieces, whereas white uh, has this b5 knight, which is out of play, and also this e4 bishop isn't isn't helping much in the in the defense. So this was a really rather one-sided game, and maybe if you just played it through. Um, without any commentary or so, you would just say, okay, this is not a very impressive game, he just smashed him, Kaipo just smashed his opponent, but what makes the game really uh, really special, in my opinion, is is the position after 12 knight f4, where black really needed to find a nice play, uh, a nice uh, plan in order to, to unfold his play naturally, and I think that most of us wouldn't play knight fe7 in such a position, we would just play some random move and hope for the best, but Capo really uh, was focused and um, played a move which maybe wasn't uh, looking so well, but uh, strategically made a lot of sense. My name is Jan Marcos, and this was my video on the coordination of pieces from the series uh, Anatoly Carpo on strategy. This was the ninth video and I'm looking forward to meet again uh, at the last video of this series. Have a nice day. Bye bye.